interesting paper. Um, uh, I want to say uh, what they, I see is the. I'll give you a, a, my own take on it here. Figure out what this moves. This one. Um, here, here's what they're studying. Uh, they're, they're they're asking this question. Here's the question: How do certain monetary policies, possibly a combination of fiscal policies, affect inflation and output uh, when interest rates are at or near the zero lower bound, which is um, clearly an important, timely question. Um, well, why is it important, at least to this audience, is that there's some, there's some models that suggest that uh, in, these, in these new Keynesian models uh, with adaptive learning agents, um, a large negative shock to expectations can uh, uh, result in a self-sustaining uh, deflationary spiral, which we could call a liquidity trap, um, and that's some work by uh, Evans, Hoppapoy, and Kuz. Um, so that's the kind of motivation is, uh, well, if we're in such a spiral, uh, how do we get out of it? Uh, and, uh, and what they're going to investigate are some monetary policies and in combination also with the fiscal policy. Um, it's also important because uh, um, private sector responses to various monetary policies are generally uh, not known. Um, for the simple reason that central, central banks don't do experiments, um, you know, it's uh, unethical, uh, not to mention politically impossible. So uh, that means that uh, the laboratory is actually a very reasonable place in which to do this kind of stuff. So I want to, I want to advocate on behalf of, of of Yasmina and for experiments in uh, um, in monetary uh, policy because I think it's exactly the right way to do it. Um, you know, it's fine. This is a group that does uh, learning. It's fine to theorize about learning. Um, but, you know, once you venture into bounded rationality, you might as well go and, and, and look at what people actually do and, 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 and empirically validate those, those boundedly rational models. So laboratory studies provide an opportunity to do just that, um, you know, validate on a small scale, let's say, in the lab, before rolling something out uh, in the larger scale. I, I like to think of it as akin to kind of wind tunnel testing of, uh, of, of aircraft prototypes before you fly them. Right? I think that's a good analogy. But I'll point out that there's a lot of other professions that study what you might think of as aggregate phenomena in the small scale of the laboratory. You think about evolutionary biology, evolution, that's, that's kind of macro topic. Um, how do people study that in the laboratory? They look at successive generations of fruit flies, for example. So, so I, I think macroeconomists have been kind of uh, late to this notion, although there's, there's a number of them doing them now, uh, of, that we can, we can test these models in the, lab, in the small scale of the laboratory. You can get approximately competitive outcomes, too, with not too many agents. Uh, so Cars has done this, and, and Yasmina, and some other people. But I think, I think that central banks should be really thinking about uh, doing uh, more of these kinds of experiments <coughs> to validate their, their policies in the... Before, before putting them out um, or even implementing them if, if, if they work. So here's the model that they're studying. It's a, it's a pretty standard uh, reduced form uh, New Keynesian model. Uh, there's an a expectational Phillips curve. Uh, there's an IS equation. Um, a, a couple things that are maybe less standard is they're going to have a, 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 a natural rate of interest here, RT, that they're going to treat as a kind of shock to expectations. Uh, and that's the thing that they're going, to, they're going to switch. They're going to turn, they're going to uh, shock that. And they're going to also have uh, fiscal policies going to enter as another kind of shock, GT. So this is going to be off in their baseline. They're going to just shock this thing. Uh, and then... Um, They'll, they'll do a, 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 another a case where they, uh, they, they shock uh, G. And the interest rate rule is a Taylor rule, uh, which respects the zero lower bound, and this autoregressive process on this uh, natural rate shock. It's the parameterization, steady state uh, is, is, is uh, calculated. And um, the baseline is really this. So you have an inflation target in your Taylor rule here that's zero. Okay, and you know coefficients are such that you know the weight on the uh, uh, inflation uh, gap here respects the Taylor principle. Um, 
Then uh, they're going to, this is their, their baseline treatment is this, con, they call this the constant inflation target. Then they're going to look at a so-called state-dependent inflation target, which is this thing here. Uh, and I, I just learned in the talk where this comes from. So it's uh, from Egertsen and, uh, and Woodford based on a price-level targeting framework. Um, this is a, this is a, this is a state-dependent target where you're going to adjust the inflation target over time depending on what actually happens to realizations of inflation and the output cap. Okay, so that's the, that's the model. And so the main hypothesis uh, to be tested, I, there's really three that I could discern here. One is a kind of theoretical one, which is um, that one that they validate using, um, uh, uh, they, they solve the model uh, numerically and they do some, they do some impulse response functions. Uh, and, and out of that they get that following a large negative output shock, um, <clears throat> You know the economy recovers more quickly under the um, state-dependent inflation targeting rule than under the constant rule. And the intuition there is that under rational expectations, the central bank can can immediately move expectations by saying hmm, we want we don't want inflation to be higher. And so that, that that's a that's a very simple uh, way uh, by which you could speed up the recovery to a negative shock to expectations. So that's the kind of main theoretical hypothesis. There's a really interesting behavioral hypothesis here, which is that under this state-dependent targeting regime, directional or qualitative information may be more effective than precise inflation target information. And the idea here is that the central bank might lose credibility from failing to meet a certain target. So if I say, uh, well, instead of 0%, I want 2% inflation, and I don't meet it, then uh, people may not believe me. But instead of saying, if we don't get 0%, and instead of saying 2%, I just say, I want higher inflation. Higher. Higher. Well, that, that, that kind of qualitative information is much fuzzier, but uh, may, may uh, help uh, 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 in getting uh, the coordination necessary uh, on the announcement to to work in uh, changing expectations. So that's a, I think that's an interesting question that really is one that you would want to examine in the laboratory. Um, why? Well, um, it's, I, I started to think about how to even model how people would use such directional information. I'll say more about that later. Um, and then there's a third hypothesis, which is kind of theoretical, kind of behavioral, which is that uh, well-timed policy here uh, in the constant inflation target regime, a well-time expansionary fiscal policy, so a big, a big fiscal stimulus essentially, uh, may reduce the duration severity of the crisis. Um, so uh, it's theoretical in the sense that there's some models that that predict this effect. Um, it's behavioral because I, they haven't really tied down how the fiscal policy uh, works uh, in, 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 through the model, uh, but. Uh, essentially, the intuition for this is that expansionary fiscal policy is going to stabilize uh, expectations at the zero lower bound. So they did a laboratory implementation here. It's a so-called learning to forecast design where the, the, the human subjects are just providing expectations of inflation and the output gap. They had nine subjects supply forecasts for these variables. Um, they gave them information, historical information on past realizations of inflation, output, um, interest rates, forecast errors, shocks, and so on. And practice, uh, some practice with the environment, a lot of qualitative information. The median forecast was used to determine the realizations of XT and high T. Monetary incentives depended on how close they got to the ex post realized values. And there are these four treatments, constant <coughs> inflation target, state dependent, quantitative, state dependent, directional, and then the constant target plus expansionary fiscal policy. Okay? And they did a large negative shock midway through, uh, and they did it re twice repeated. So main findings is basically among experienced subjects, there's no significant differences in the duration and severity of crisis between the constant and the state-dependent inflation targeting regime. So this very uh, Rococo uh, monetary policy, state dependence, doesn't seem to matter here. Um, you might as well just have a kind of, uh, uh, you know, fixed target. Um, uh, so that's uh, that's interesting. Uh, 
they find that the coordination of expectations on the central bank target depends on the severity of the negative shock. Um, and the main, the main result is that there's a big reduction in the severity and duration of crises if you just have the constant inflation target and you augment that with some expansionary fiscal policy that's well-timed to you know, come about right after the uh, crisis occurs. Um, so my assessment is that it's a, it's, a, you know, it's a pioneering study looking at how to do monetary fiscal policy in a, in a, a case where we're near at the zero lower bound. Um, I think, as I said, experimental evidence is useful as a data generating process uh, of the economy is known here, and, and you can then compare predictions uh, of, of, of theoretical models, either of rational expectations or learning, to, uh, to what happens in the lab. The results suggest that sort of exotic state-dependent monetary policy is not very useful at the zero lower bound, as I said, uh, uh, whereas a very well-timed expansionary fiscal policy uh, uh, does very well at uh, getting a recovery going. Yeah, you know, I don't want to say a caution is always warranted in extrapolating from laboratory of the field. Um, one thing about these learning to forecast experiments is that subjects are just forming expectations. That's all they're doing. Optimization is not happening here. It's a linear, it's a linearized model. It's a reduced form model. Um, my experience is that uh, subjects have no difficulty forming expectations. So the hard part is in the optimization. <laughs> that's where. Uh, that's where. Uh, if, you, if you want to study bounded rationality, that's, that's where the bounded rationality often happens. Humans are very good pattern recognizers. If you show them time series, they can, they can generally get it. So uh, some, some comments, and then I'll finish. Um, so first, I didn't understand the derivation of the state-dependent inflation target. Uh, now I know that it comes from uh, Egertson and Woodford, but uh, it looked like some kind of optimal policy. Uh, and, and then I thought it was kind of difficult to square with the Taylor rule, which is non-optimal uh, in this framework. So, so some discussion of this would be, uh, would be useful. Um, uh, I was trying to think of how you could model the difference between quantitative and qualitative directional information about the inflation target. So a, there's a, a negative shock, and the central bank says uh, more inflation, more inflation, more inflation. Reminded me of the Saturday Night Live skit about more cowbell. You know, it's like, um, well, how much more? Uh, it's, it's not clear how you would even model that. But behaviorally, that might, that might, be in, that might, that might work better. Um, they look at several measures of policy effectiveness, duration, and severity of crises. I think uh, since you have the data generating process here, another thing to look at is just uh, the, the extent of the departure from the rational expectation solution. So, so which of these policies gets you further away from the uh, rational solution? Um, you know, uh, the, the, the big issue I have here is that the fiscal policy is not very well defined here. It's just a big positive shock, essentially. Um, it's not subject to any budget balance. So, uh, 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 so a natural question is, uh, what if you made it subject to budget balance and you had Ricardian uh, private sector agents, uh, would these policies be as effective? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, you might want to think about a state-dependent fiscal policy rule that's a more direct counterpart to a, um, a monetary state-dependent uh, inflation targeting rule. And this is done in Benabib et al.'s paper. And finally, uh, I think some more discussion of the magnitude or the impact of these shocks that are studied would be useful. Uh, the large negative shock was implemented to get you into this uh, liquidity trap, but how large the fiscal policy shock should be and, 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 and the details surrounding that, I think, uh, could be clarified. But overall, I thought it was very interesting and nice, important first step in studying this question.